one. Uh, good morning. Thanks, Amelia, for starting that. Um, and thanks, everybody, for taking some time this morning. Um, uh, I'm going to share my screen. We'll put an agenda up, and we'll just kind of real quick. Uh, I think everybody, hopefully, has had a chance to introduce themselves in previous meetings, but uh, just for a quick reminder uh, so that we know who, who you are. Um, this is the, the ED Boarding and Crowding Work Group Solutions subgroup. So hopefully you're in the right place. Uh, John Bankoff, I'm the chair of the emergency department at Middlesex Hospital. Uh, and uh, just in the order of kind of uh, Hollywood squares on my screen, uh, I'll go around and, and ask you guys to introduce yourself. Looks like on my screen, Dan Fries, you're first. Yeah, Dan Fries, I'm uh, an attending at Hartford Hospital, but represent Connecticut College of Emergency Physicians. Awesome. Thank you. Michael Holmes. Mike Holmes, I'm the Chief Operating Officer at Yale New Haven Hospital and co-chair with uh, Dr. Moore on the uh, the committee. Excellent. John Brancato. Uh, good morning. Um, I'm the Division of Emergency Medicine at Connecticut Children's. Excellent. Phil Rowland. Good morning, all. Uh, Phil Rowland with Cigna Healthcare, Medical Director for the State of Connecticut. Welcome. Miriam Miller. Everyone, Miriam Miller, Policy Director at the Department of Public Health. Thank you. Greg Allard. Uh, good morning. I'm with the Hartford Healthcare EMS Network. I'm representing the Association of Connecticut Ambulance Providers. Thank you. And Doc Fox, no video, but audio. Yes, Doc Fox. Feeling a little under the weather, so <laughs> I'm going to stay off video. Um, I am the co chair of this uh, subcommittee, and I um, also am part of the Connecticut Nurses Association, um, and I currently work at Danbury Hospital. Excellent. Thanks. Thanks, Doc, and sorry to hear you're not feeling well. We will jump onto a agenda item. Let me see if I can share a screen here. And you guys let me know if you can see that okay. Thumbs up from Phil Rowland. All right. Yep. So, uh, I didn't call us to order, but uh, officially we can uh, say that this meeting has started and uh, it is being recorded. Uh, we've got representation from multiple uh, hospital and health systems, as well as uh, Department of Public Health. Um, uh, I'm going to swap off from this screen, if I can, to a different one. Give me one second. Uh, and uh, hopefully uh, you all had a chance to uh, look at this. This is uh, a bunch of stuff that I just kind of put together last week, um, compilation of thoughts from myself and Doc and Chris Moore uh, and Barbara Cass, and then also um, just some pulled in uh, content, if you will, uh, on this topic. Um, so from a kind of formal perspective, uh, this subgroup uh, is um, focused on um, the evaluation of what we hope will be a quality metric that will come out of our quality subgroup. And the goal is to develop a plan to decrease the percentage of admitted boarders, admitted patients boarding on our EDs um, that uh, we expect will come from that quality subgroup. So once we have that percentage, our goal is to decrease it. Obviously, there's a lot that goes into that. Uh, and so what I tried to put together for us just as a jumping off uh, kind of points of discussion uh, was some of the background into boarding uh, and some of the uh, you know previously established causes, uh, attempts at solutions, uh, and then a few of just my ideas um, that I wanted to share with this group and, and then hopefully solicit some of your thoughts and perspective and feedback from your areas of discipline, whether that be uh, working in the ED, uh, whether that be overseeing um, uh, EMS, uh, whether you're a physician or a nurse, uh, and then of course, um, some of the other non-clinical, non-bedside contributors, whether that's the insurance side of the house um, or uh, the state of, you know, where ultimately our goal is to bring recommendations from this subgroup back to the main work group uh, to uh, complete uh, our our report do one one twenty five. How am I doing so far? Everybody good? Any 
questions or comments before I kind of walk through some of this document? So when you say um, admit fewer patients, so of the number of patients that come through our doors, decrease the number of admitted patients for uh, that in. Is that what you mean there or? Uh, yes, so let, and let me, let me walk that back quickly for a second, Michael. Um, there are, and any of the you know other folks on this call, please anytime uh, jump in. The, the the kind of three contributors to throughput. I'm sorry to um, you know to workflow in the ED input, throughput, output. Uh, all three of those have contributors to boarding and crowding. Uh -huh. The throughput piece. Most health systems have worked or are working individually within their system to kind of uh, you know improve their workflow, whether that be turnaround times in the lab or times for radiology, uh, ancillary services. Uh, those are patients, th those are kind of workflows that the patient's already there and we're trying to improve and decrease their length of stay in the ED. That one has a lot of attention already on it. Uh, at you know a lot of local levels as well as all the way up to the national level, but my opinion, and you know I'm certainly interested to hear uh, others on this call. I don't think there are as many high-level state-involved uh, opportunities to improve throughput because a lot of that is locally controlled. A lot of that is uh, kind of in the house, so to speak. The two that seem to have the most opportunity for this group and for our overall group is how do we better decrease those that don't need to come to the emergency department and how do we help accelerate the process out of the emergency department for those that are there that need to be admitted. So the input, Michael, that admit fewer patients doesn't necessarily mean discharge patients that you would otherwise admit from the ED. It's are there alternatives to them coming to the ED in the first place that we can highlight, whether that be, and we talk a little bit about that further down, um, whether that be increase in availability of primary care, um, some success possibilities there, um, whether that be uh, alternate destinations. Uh, and that's a big topic, certainly in different disciplines within our profession, um, hospital at home and um, the expansion of home care services, um, telemedicine and virtual monitoring, uh, community paramedicine, uh, and then one that's kind of at the state level um, and has not fully left uh, and been incorporated at, from the state level, but I do believe there are some health systems that have had some success with more or MIH or some version of that. Um, so I don't know if, uh, you know, I'll kind of pause there for a second. Any thoughts on, uh, you know, the kind of the general input side of the house? Uh, anybody have specific comments about those two bullets or uh, perhaps other bullets, uh, thoughts and ideas that they think we should focus on if we're gonna look at an input contributor? Yeah, I, I asked that question because there's there's national data out there on the percentage of admissions uh, based on your total visits, you know, somewhere I see numbers, you know, from, you know, 18 to 30%, whatever. This is a little bit different than keeping them from coming to us. So I like I like the the explanation. I would I would add under your inputs is um, the potential for load balancing, and that could be through efforts like diversion, which we are not clear, uh, at least to my understanding, in Connecticut, on the mechanism of diversion. Understood. Thank you. And I did mention, and it's probably a little further down um, in output, but load balancing. Uh, perhaps with a little bit of a different slant, Michael, than, than what you're just referencing, uh, you know, kind of with reference to you know, diversion, but load balancing, uh, we'll talk about um, a little bit on the output side uh, in, a, in a couple minutes if we can. Thank you. Other thoughts, um, either on the input, decreasing patients coming to the ED, um, or perhaps patients that are in the ED, that traditional practice would be to admit them but if we had an alternative that was reasonable and uh, actionable, that we could in fact discharge them instead. 
I would just say that I think we probably want to focus, no, obviously look at both, but really it comes down to more the discharge. Um, the people that are diverted away from, from input are people that probably weren't going to be admitted. Uh, and the boarding and crowding is primarily an issue of um, admission and holding admissions. Uh, so yes, we want to kind of passively look at input, but and those are all good things to limit input for the health system as a whole. But in terms of focus on boarding and crowding, I think the output's the most important part. Yeah, and Dan, I agree. Uh, I, I wrote this up here. I think we should spend some time on input, but the lion's share of actionable solution lives with output. So I think we're on the same page. I'm uh, hesitant to get too far into uh, specifics on output without talking to, to some of the folks on the discharge solutions subgroup. Uh, like I mentioned to to Chris, I don't want to uh, do do the same thing in this group that they're working on in theirs, but definitely some of the areas that they're looking at um, include discharge lounges and reducing obstacles to discharge. Barbara included several comments in um, in her email to me about, and I'll kind of scroll down to those here about how do we work on using partnerships in the community better, whether that be with uh, EMS, whether that be with urgent care centers for pediatric patients, um, more often certainly improving our partnerships with nursing homes, um, non-ambulance transport. All of these are potential obstacles and barriers to getting patients out of our hospital and clogging up capacity. So. Uh, opportunity with all of those from the output side. And she brought back this uh, comment on community mobile integrated health, um, which to me has kind of uh, involvement on both the input and the output side. Um, again, the, the idea being, and, and I don't know, Greg, if you have personal familiarity or if you've been involved with this, uh, I can speak to some efforts we've made at Middlesex that were helpful during COVID, but then kind of dried up post COVID based on a little bit of lack of financial resource for it. Um, but the idea being involving either providers, APRNs, PAs, or the potential for paramedics, which other states have had great success with, um, and having paramedics uh, respond to calls in the field uh, in um, more of an emergent environment, but also post admission, post acute care follow-up, um, transport assistance for alternative destinations other than the hospital. Uh, so Greg, I'm curious if you've been involved at the state level with any of that. Yeah, there's been a, a lot of involvement uh, by EMS in that we have a subcommittee as part of the EMS advisory board that's you know, been working with OEMS for quite some time. We were instrumental in getting it passed into legislation, hasn't been enacted yet. Um, there is actually a, an upcoming educational piece um, announcing its an, uh, its release um, in March 18th at the CHA, actually. So it's an open um, uh, thing where people could just uh, show up and, and, and learn about it. It's a full day event. They got guest speakers coming in and whatnot. But it is a, a, a very robust program. There's a lot of possibilities. I think it could definitely help on the input and the, uh, and the output side of things. Um, input, there's nurse triage programs that could be, you know, you know, instituted into, into, di into um, dispatch centers and stuff like that. So we're not even responding to the number of calls, bringing those patients into the EDs, filling them up, that, that type of thing. Um, there's the programs, like you mentioned, post-discharge. So, you know, if there's a, a certain type of patient, you know, a CHF patient or something like that, where the medics could go out and follow up on those patients. Um, over a period of time and obviously having contact with the uh, patient's uh, physicians and note taking and all other stuff could certainly be potential. There, there's a, a, a number of programs that could, you know, certainly be helpful with MIH. Awesome. Thank you. And, and I can say that one of the areas that when we tried to roll this out um, without that kind of state level support and, you know, legislation yet was to look at reducing readmissions. Right there's there are longstanding challenges with certain uh, you know comorbidities and patient populations that we see routinely come back to our EDs and there's associated penalties with uh, readmission uh, of some of those patients so uh, that to us was kind of low hanging um, 
you know, I, I feel strongly that this is a potential solution, but as I mentioned up top here, it is going to require support, you know, uh, both financial and regulatory. Um, and it sounds like uh, that is kind of slowly moving along, Greg, at the state level, which is great. Massachusetts has had success with this for years um, with community paramedicine. So the model and the precedent are out there. Yeah, it's it's um, the final legal paper documents being reviewed are with the OPM, I guess they went from OEMS to OPM. And they should, once they're done there, then I think they're, um, they're all set and we should be good to go. They had to review a bunch of documents, applications, all kinds of stuff that each service that would need to fill out that wants to do this. So that's where it sits. Got it. So just circling back, I mentioned input and we talked a little bit about some of those things and uh, Dan stepped away, but I agree with him. Um, my my kind of research and, and time spent on this topic, uh, both here at our health system, but just in general, um, is that output is the area of opportunity. Um, and within output, there's a ton of things that can be focused on. I think the purpose uh, of this subgroup is to kind of select the ones that we think have the most potential for success and the most uh, potential involvement uh, of our partners at the state uh, to help us, uh, you know, ideally apply some solutions that any of our health systems can implement or arguably are required to implement. If there's um, some level of state, um, for lack of a better word, I know mandate is a tough word, but um, state uh, emphasis uh, regulatory emphasis on this. So Chris asked me to include a couple of things here. I've highlighted them on the screen. And this was somewhat generated by a recent uh, article out of Massachusetts and Mass General, um, who has previously put in for a um, CON um, for more beds. Uh, essentially, can we add capacity to open up space for more of these borders? Um, and then, of course, the second part to that kind of hand in hand would be adding staffing either to existing beds that are shuttered because of lack of staffing. Or if you were to get more beds, you would, of course, have to staff them to have any value. Uh, I put a little comment that these are controversial. Um, you know, the pushback in Massachusetts has been that Mass General's beds are very expensive and that there may be actually uh, lower cost opportunities than just adding more beds. Um, there's also certainly a huge cost component to anything like this. If we're going to add and open up more beds, build beds, and then staff them. So I don't know that those are actionable short-term solutions, um, but uh, Chris asked me to include them here. Um, some of the other kind of bullets that I'll just run through for sake of time and then ask you guys to you know speak to or chime in on is uh, Michael referenced load balancing. I can speak to how our health system works, and I imagine Dan can speak to to his, and and everybody on this call can probably reference some of the same. Uh, the ED uh, owns all of these patients, right? That's kind of by definition, and we don't have the best level of control to smooth out the uh, choke points in the system. Some of the more frequent ones uh, would be: this is a seven day, twenty four hour operation but most places run five days or even four and a half with some of their ancillary services and staffing. So how do we better, and this is not a state level necessarily solution. This is probably more individual or health system owned solution, but how do we better balance the load of these patients? We could probably look forward into Mondays two years from now and predict relatively well what our Monday boarding will look like in January, right? We can probably also do the same with how it'll look on Saturday and Sunday. I can speak for Middlesex. We do not have balanced discharges through the system on seven days a week. We have three days a week that are heavy, and we have two days a week that are less, and we have two that Saturday and Sunday, we probably discharge less than half of what we discharge on the other days. And there's a lot of reasons for that, right? And some of those roll into some of the comments that Dan made in a previous email and that Barbara added in hers, which is, how do we help get patients out on Saturday and Sunday when they're ready to go clinically, but we don't have the ability to get them out, whether that's lack of availability of SNF capacity, whether it's transportation, whether it's insurance authorization, whether it's some other non-clinical barrier. 
So again, I'll kind of pause there and, and ask for comment thoughts from anybody uh, in the group, uh, either from your perspective at, at your system or just general thoughts that you may have. You guys have got it all figured out, huh? This is just a system issue for me. No, ditto. Everything you said, 100%, <laughs> I'll second it. <laughs> Everything you said, we have the same challenge. So I highlighted a comment down here. I underlined rather a comment that I thought was telling. This was from an ASAP paper years ago, but computer model that struck me. If you shift discharge median times by one hour to the left, you can cut boarding in half. And if you shift it four hours earlier, you essentially eliminate boarding. For years at Middlesex, we've had a discharge goal of more than 50% by 2 p.m. And for years, we've been able to accomplish it barely, 51, 52, 53%. What I've struggled with is to get administration to shift that goal either left or up, right? We've just kind of become comfortable with where we are. 52% by 2 p.m., great. Let's go to... 45% by one, let's go to 35% by noon, whatever it is, but move it left because we know when our admissions are coming in and when our peak admission time is 3 p.m., we've, we're on the wrong side of that equation, right? I'm curious, Dan or um, other physicians uh, or doc on this call, um, John, do you guys have internal health system focus metrics, financial incentives for a uh, percentage of discharges by a certain time or um, you know, other uh, kind of internal uh, attention to this? Yes, <laughs> yes, uh, attention. Yes, we track it. No, we haven't been able to move it very much. Um, or we have, uh, a, we have probably our average discharge time is three o'clock in the afternoon. Um, but they're, we're trying to up the percentage of discharges by noon, but it's been very, very slow. It, it, it astounds me um, why that's so difficult. Um, and even as we've focused on it more, we've added more barriers um, specific to us. We used to have two 24-hour pharmacies a block away, and now there are none. There's only, uh, I don't think there's a single 24-hour pharmacy in the city of Hartford. Um, and the only one nearby is in West Hartford, several miles away. So more discharge patients who have medication needs, have them delivered to them before they're discharged. Well, that adds some time, of course, and that's just one little thing. Um, so anyways, I've, I've got some other thoughts about some other stuff down here, but I'll hold them. Okay. Uh, I, I don't know if Hartford does. I don't have the right title or titles with my name to be privy to that information, but... Um, I know we, our biggest struggle on probably the discharge end that I hear, and again, I'm not in those meetings, is that just getting enough hospital staff and enough staff to do the discharges uh, based on the volume of patients. So I think it's a matter of upstaffing and uh, assigning roles more so than setting times at this time, at this point. Uh, but I could be wrong on that. Anu Singh could probably tell you a lot more detail about that uh, in terms of what's going on. Um, my, my, my sort of Fear is not a fear. The point is, yes, these are the things that probably make the most effect on boarding is the discharges and smoothing the switching the surgical schedule, smoothing the discharge schedule. Uh, but my what I don't know is how you legislate that on a state level. Right. Um, these are all great recommendations, but I don't know necessarily how you legislate it. Not to say there aren't, and I'm sure there's some creative ways that other people can come up with. But that's no, a little, and, that's, and that's I, a little part that I struggle with. Yeah, and I agree, Dan. I, you know, I in preparing for this, I kind of looked at the output side with two arms, right? What can the state legislate? What can we recommend to them that they can then apply broadly? And which of these are more internally focused, uh, you know, at your own place of work? Even if we all agree that a few of these bullets, smoothing surgeries, smoothing discharges, upstaffing, uh, you know, non-clinical EVS and people on the weekends, but what we might be able to accomplish in our health system might be easier or harder in some of the others. And really the state probably doesn't have a lot of involvement in kind of pushing and regulating some of those. Um, other thoughts? 
Yeah. Oh, so, uh, my my one thought is what the state can do is shine a light on it. Yeah. And if there was some like public metric, or even if even if there's no stick with that carrot, uh, just putting it out there and saying, hey, oh wait a minute, like Middlesex is able to do fifty two percent of their discharges by two p.m. Here at Hartford, it looks like we only get thirty five. Hmm. Uh, but just having that data out there and sort of that shared sense, I think that's something probably the state or legislature could do. Yeah, and if I can ask, I think at my the way my screen's set up, I can't see, but I'm assuming Miriam is still here just off my screen. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious, this next bullet, um, the idea of what was tried somewhat successfully in Europe and perhaps might be something we could talk about that would involve the state is some sort of associated, um, for lack of a better word, penalty if we were to establish a four hour rule or some rule that said you have to have patients out of your ED, boarding patients out of your ED by X number of hours after the admission order goes in. And when we do our site visits, this is something we're gonna look at, right? This is gonna be a metric that we ask you to produce and what's your percentage if there's a state established time target? And is that a reasonable, uh, almost disciplinary ask that DPH would say, this is an expectation, just like any of the other things that DPH focuses on, falls and restraints and other things, it's a safety issue. Is that something that we should look at or potentially bring back for you know broader discussion? Yeah, so two things. I think one, I want to comment on Dan's uh, comment about uh, data sharing and kind of having publicly available data. Um, I I would encourage, like, think this is a good example of something that can be done without legislation or without state involvement. If you're able to get C, uh, CHA involved, it seems like that's something that kind of is more suited for them because um, to the second point and what you're asking about is that really you're looking at regulatory action and where DPH is going to get involved is, is where there needs to be enforcement. So I think this like publicly available data, you know, shaming for the lack of better word of saying like, if they can do it, why can't you? Um, that might not be the best use of state resources. Uh, but as far as the European, you know, four hour rule, um, you know, I think you really want to think about what, what does enforcement of that look like, right? So we're not, you know, looking at what we do, you know, the things that we do that have like really immediate responses or like immediate jeopardy complaints that we see at nursing homes or hospitals or something along those lines, right? Um, and then, you know, this four hour rule, you, you would wanna really think about a way to kind of, that doesn't require immediate action and is more kind of, like a cumulative approach. So looking at what we're doing with hospitals, staffing plans for nurses, right? Um, you know, while the rollout of that has been a little controversial, but you can say that, you know, the enforcement is, are you hitting your staffing levels 80% of the time, right? And so thinking about, you know, okay, are you gonna be penalized if one patient um, isn't, you know, assigned in five hours? So I think really looking at what that looks like in reality and what it looks like from an enforcement perspective is gonna be important. Um, something like this where we're probably not hitting that four hour or whatever metric we decide, um, you know, you'd wanna ease into that because if you just start enforcing it, everyone's getting fined, right? And so you need some sort of grace period you probably want to collect the data to see where people are as far as how long it's taking them right now to get that assignment. Um, but then from an enforcement perspective, it's going to be a lot of work on the DPH end. And I'm just going to warn you, you would, you would need a, a good amount of resources to do that. Uh, but those are kind of the things that I would I would encourage you to think about. All right. No, I appreciate that. I, my opinion, if we try to implement some sort of four hour rule right now, everybody would fail and miserably fail. Like the lowest possible, you would have probably nobody hitting high percentages. Um, that said, it, it was controversial when it was introduced in Europe and it 
I don't know where the current status is with that rule. Um, it it had a lot of momentum um, and it did move the needle at least for a while. I don't know if that's the solution here. Uh, that's just one of the ideas that was proposed. Um, unfortunately, it looks like, uh, was it Phil that was on representing Cigna? It looks like Phil has has dropped. I, I actually wanted to ask something that, that Anu Singh and her group, and I know Dan, you had brought this up, is what role, if any, does the state have working with insurance to help us uh, open up the limitations in authorization and getting patients, particularly Saturdays and Sundays, holidays, whatever they are, where currently we just are marking time. These patients have no chance of leaving our system, whether boarding or whether inpatients upstairs taking up beds because we can't get authorization. So I'll probably message him separately. And, and if that's uh, something that he wants to, at our next meeting, uh, if he's interested in, in speaking to, um, but I think that's a huge contributor uh, to our, you know, kind of obstacle or barrier to, to discharges. To Barbara's question and comment, delayed discharges, developing processes to ensure discharges happen earlier. That's a huge area of focus. And the things that contribute to that, one I just mentioned, another uh, Dan mentioned, which is kind of perhaps inadequate focus or lack of staffing of the admitting teams to get these patients out in the morning and the you know lunchtime hours. And then the next one, and again, I'm, I'm interested also, I don't know if this will overlap, Greg, with what you do, but the non-emergency transport. So I, I can speak again locally, we struggle to get patients out, whether it's by VAO or some other entity. Um, and uh, Barbara put it anecdotally, she's heard that we have a hard time getting uh, these patients out. I can confirm it, right? It, it is 100% accurate and it's every day. So I'm, I imagine I see John nodding and I, I imagine any of the other clinicians on this call can, can confirm that transportation is a challenge for patients leaving the system. Even after they've been identified, sometimes 9 a.m., they're ready to go. And it's 2 p.m. when their ride gets here. Um, so anybody have thoughts on that? Well, it, it is it is not, not just a challenge for um, non-acute you know, discharge transportation to rehab facilities, et cetera. It's a, it's a challenge for interfacility transport as well. So, you know, I took a transfer from a, from a hospital elsewhere in the state last week in the early evening or maybe two weeks ago, and it was going to be nine hours for them to get an available ambulance. Um, not, not okay. <laughs> Needless to say. So that this, I'm just, uh, supporting that it's definitely a problem. Great. Yeah, Other there's, comments, Greg or, or Dan? There's a, there's a lot that really goes into determining the availability of ambulances. It depends on the volume at the time, how many ambulances, where that, like like John just mentioned, where that hospital is that that patient's coming from and the services available in that area. There's so many factors in, in that part, but the non-EM, non-emergency transports done by the wheelchair services and stuff like that's definitely an issue statewide with um the ambulance services got out of those out of that business for the you know for the majority there's a few few of us that still do a couple of them but yeah it's really been a, a concern everywhere on that side of things i was doing to say the exact same thing and it's not something i know much about but uh something i had noticed and was confirmed by a colleague that sort of when i trained which is 10 15 years ago we had these robust wheelchair van services where you could get someone out that just needed a, a ride, basically, not a full ambulance. Um, and those seem to have gone away. And it's not my area of expertise to say why or, or know anything about it. Maybe Greg would comment more, but we just don't seem to have that anymore. And I think that would serve a big gap in the system. Yeah, a, a lot of it was due to reimbursement um, for the ambulance services, uh, that ran all those, you know, American ambulance where I worked, uh, had 17 wheelchair vans and, uh, you know, we have none now because of the reimbursement process and the time to manage those patients and the staff, um, was far, took more time and more costly than it was to manage the ambulance side of the business, which is kind of unusual, but that's just the way that it was. And, 
you know, once one company made a decision, everybody started to follow and look at their process and then they all, then they all jumped out of it. So, um, you know, that, that was part of that reason. It's a little bit different now with uh, our situation at American and through Hunters because it's hospital owned. Um, there may be some thought process at some point in time for them to go back into that service to better service the patients within the, that system, but I can't speak for the others. Understood. Uh, John, you had referenced you had some other thoughts and you were going to kind of table them. You want to introduce them? Yeah, just looking down on this list of things that thoughts from Barbara. Um, the the urgent care thing, I'm not sure what she means there. Um, we are hoping still to see um, better use of the, not the school-based school based health centers, because at least within the city of Hartford, I think they're, they're used pretty well. Um, but they... Um, uh, mental health um, urgent care centers, which have just started this year, um, kind of off to a slow start. And as they ramp up their capacity, hopefully that will be helpful, um, at least for some of us who get a lot of referrals in that area. But P we have in greater Hartford, at least um, three pediatric urgent care centers that have um, still some more capacity. Um, I, I don't know if this is, there's a suggestion in this bullet that uh, EMS would be diverted to urgent care centers. That seems like not necessarily a good thing. And certainly um, from an EMTALA standpoint, I'm not sure how that would work, um, but th they're used already. I, one of the things that I think we don't recognize enough is why people come to emergency departments. There, there's, there's very often an assumption it's because there's not enough um, other options. And certainly we we see some kids who the, the parents have reached out to their primary care and they don't have the capacity to see them at sick visits. So there's absolutely some truth in there. But people come to emergency departments because they perceive that whatever they whatever's wrong with them or their family member, that they can get it all taken care of. That we 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 do a good job and that's why people come. And, and some things certainly are easier and faster. And um, so that's why urgent care centers are all over the place now where they weren't 15 or 20 years ago. But there are a lot of people who come to emergency departments because we do a good job and they're worried about themselves or their family member. So I, I, I just kind of speaking to that from the standpoint that um, the the big answer is not going to be in in moving the inflow. I think as you kind of alluded to earlier. That's all. Yeah, and and just real quick, uh, and I think Dan, you probably have comment on this too. You you commented before the the focus on boarding going back fifteen years. Initially, the thought was, well, this is all the in, inappropriate visits to the ED, and how do we stop that? And it was pretty quickly borne out that a that wasn't the primary contributor to admissions, a lot of those people don't get admitted. And B, that really per that percentage wasn't as um, perhaps great as was expected or advertised. Um, so I, I think we're all in agreement that the input piece, to me at least, the area of focus, if any, would be kind of what ET3, which I think has been retired, but was trying to accomplish the alternate destination where, John, your question was, hey, can an ambulance choose a different place besides the ED, whether that's an urgent care, a primary care, a detox center, whatever? Uh, I would like to think the answer to that is yes, but the swell, uh, the groundswell for things like ET3, I just, I don't think it, I don't know that it had the uh, impact that perhaps federal government and others had hoped. Um, so Greg, Dan, and, and if you have comments, and uh, Miriam, I see your hand raised, just uh, one second, okay? I do think an alternative destination is still a possibility through the MIH program. It would have to be specific identified patients for us to take to different locations through our guidelines or protocols at the statewide level. So I do think there's possibility there. It just needs to be hashed out through the docs such as yourselves and through our uh, advisory board, uh, medical advisory committee. Yeah, I agree. I think that's the area of focus for the input side. Dan. Yeah, I agree with everything people are saying. I think the alternate destination does have possibility and potential, um, but as it's written here, sort of the utilization and message, the messaging to go to urgent cares 
uh, doesn't actually work in one of the uh, statistics that continually defies all logic. Um, when you build an urgent care, it doesn't lower ED volume, um, which is the, the big expectation of, well, actually it was a big fear of emergency medicine when this boom of urgent cares came along as they're gonna take all our paying patients and vo ED volumes are gonna go down, it's gonna end EDs uh, and there's been no effect. Uh, maybe good for emergency medicine, probably not good for the for healthcare economics. Uh, it just doesn't. ED volume doesn't. You can build an urgent care next to the ED, and ED <laughs> volumes stay exactly the same. Uh, but with that said, the alternate destination side of it definitely ha definitely could have some benefit uh, in something to look into. Yeah, and again, some of this is a crossover into crowding, right? Which isn't boarding necessarily, but boarding we agree causes or contributes to crowding, but some of the alternate destination potentially, I agree, could siphon off some of the crowding aspect um, of those patients that arguably have a different place they can receive care. Miriam, you have your hand raised, thanks. Yeah, so I'm gonna, Barbara and I have talked about this some, so I'm happy to add some color to this comment from her. I think, you know, we know that if people are in an ambulance, they're going to an emergency room. Um, and I think, you know, with the extension of maybe the, the pediatric urgent care centers for, for, for uh, behavioral health crises. Um, but I think the idea here is looking at what urgent care, licensed urgent cares can do. Um, and it's, it's more of a communication thing, right? So how are we, how can we take some of this less acute care and, and move it to urgent care centers, right? And I, I don't think there's any doubt that, you know, increased urgent cares have not led to ED volume decreases, but how can we encourage that? Like what behavior, what do we have to do to, you know, institute a behavior change such that we're driving utilization um, of, of urgent care is over EVs for non-emergencies, right? So if someone needs stitches, right, they can probably go to an urgent care. Um, you know, just thinking about it in that sense. And then, you know, the other thing um, to consider is that a lot of people use urgent care as primary care. Um, and so with the opening of urgent cares, a lot of people probably stopped making PCP appointments and are now getting care at urgent cares. So how can we incur, you know, shift that behavior change as well? Um, so I think the the idea here is more behavior change rather than kind of put up more behavior, more urgent cares. You know, there's you drive ten minutes and you see four, right? Like we don't need more urgent cares, but we need people using them differently. Thank you. Um, so I, I think Doc is still here. I know he said he wasn't feeling well. Um, I wanted to give him an opportunity to to jump in, uh, add subtract, you know, make comment uh, where appropriate, and then we'll try to wrap up with some kind of next step action items. Doc, you have anything? Yeah, I just, I, I put down a few um, things that I really liked, like the home health um, likely to be discharged uh, lounge, um, kind of just ideas that were kind of flowing off on my head. Um, another one that I kind of found like getting, getting the, the boarded patient out of the ED period. I know when I worked at Yale New Haven, we had a, like a place called Seaside and it was nice because you could actually transition your, as a nurse, your assignment, you could get that inpatient person put in a different area and then they were taken care of by an inpatient nurse. And then they could easily be transitioned. You know, they might get a bed in 30 minutes. They might get a bed in 30 hours, right? Um, but they wouldn't be in that same room where there was active ED patients. Um, so just kind of thinking about the border, but this is all within the, the, in, the not the inflow or input or output. It's more the, the, the flow of the own, of their own EDs. And I think it is important to kind of hash out, um, you know, what, what the legislation can do and then what we can recommend hospitals you know, transparency throughout all hospitals in Connecticut. Here are things that people are doing to mitigate the boarding. Um, and one of the things, I don't know if I read it on an email or it was a conversation that I had with someone, but like real-time ED crowding dashboard throughout the state would be nice to be able to just kind of see, you know, what are our current numbers and how how is it is it in certain locations that it's heavy and how do we mitigate that and how can we you know, transfer someone out or 
get some flow going. Um, yeah, and I really like the conversations about, uh, you know, diversion. Um, but, you know, I think we really have to focus in on the boarding aspect of it and how do we how do we decrease that number, right? Um, and I think inflow might not be the biggest issue. It's more outflow. Yeah, agreed. And, and not and not doubling our work. I think you're you're very very correct. I need we need to be careful about, you know, what is the discharge group doing so we so we don't have the same conversation and you know use our time wisely, right? Yeah, and I appreciate that. I think specifically my my plan is to follow with Anu about um, a few of the things that I think her group is working on, and I don't know if others on this call are also helping with that subgroup. Um, but specifically the the insurance side and the uh, collaboration with the skilled nursing facility and trying to engage uh, and work with those two uh, partners to, mm -hmm. to kind of open up hours and beds and uh, improved output, uh, certainly in the areas right now where we just have limited access, weekends, evenings, um, what have you. Um, as well as things like discharge lounges. Again, that's a little bit owned by your health system, but it has been proven in places to be successful. Mount Sinai, Mass General, uh, Northwell, other, other health systems in and around this region who have invested in the creation of a discharge lounge for that subset of patients who are identified the night before or the morning of, hey, this one's ready to go, but their ride isn't available for six hours. Their family can't get them until after work. We're going to move them out of this really expensive, valuable piece of real estate inpatient bed, and we're going to put them in a non-clinical space. Um, some places use their hospital lobby, um, and they've carved out a little section of their lobby where they have security and a and a volunteer just kind of making sure they have water and uh, a charging station and access to the exit. Um, but it opens up those beds. So I just want to make sure that if Dr. Singh's group is looking at some of those specific pieces um, that we don't necessarily duplicate work. Um, so I'm gonna jump off this sharing uh, if I can. And just with the last couple minutes, try to wrap up uh, what at least I anticipate are some action items for a report back to Chris and Michael and, and perhaps for a next meeting. Um, it, it sounds like we have some agreement on the single input piece being a, a folder that includes mobile integrated healthcare and the things that come with that. And there's already state level awareness and action um, on that. So that one to me is a slam dunk, whether yeah. or not, oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah, if I can just jump in there, the, the mobile integrated health uh, regulations are about to go live. The policies and procedures should be in place. So if it would be helpful to get a presentation on what's in those regulations, we can do that. But um, that, from a regulatory perspective, there shouldn't be anything holding that up. That's great. I appreciate it. And again, I think maybe some places uh, have uh, piloted this. Uh, maybe some places are already doing something like this. But uh, Miriam, I would I, I would personally love to see when that is uh, official and the regulations, everything's been kind of public, uh, publicized rather, um, whether or not this is something that this group can then look at that and and try to incorporate into our work. Um, I, I don't know. I, I'll, I'll probably defer on that to others, but um, I would be interested to see that. Yeah. Uh, the and then, policies and procedures should be live. Say it again, I'm sorry? I think the policy and procedures should be live. Okay. Which means and, it's enforceable. And I know, Greg, you said middle of March is kind of the next, um, you know, larger group uh, discussion. And and who was involved? Was that OEMS in on March 18th? Or who, who was uh, leading that? So the advisory board, Connecticut EMS advisory board, they have a subcommittee of for mobile integrated health. They're running a symposium in conjunction with... Um, you know, OEMS and they bring in a few speakers. It's going to be at CHA. I can send the group or send this email the the information on that symposium in March. Okay, excellent. Uh, and then I think the rest of the uh, area of opportunity here is, like we said, output. 
right? And once I speak with Dr. Singh, so that we're not, uh, you know, doing the exact same thing they are, um, where are there opportunities for us to, um, to kind of bring focus? Is it a uh, dashboard that, uh, you know, is available real time and advertises uh, and shares uh, what the systems look like across the state with boarding and crowding data? Is it working with CHA to get better access to data in general? Um, and kind of to Miriam's point, uh, you know, creating uh, perhaps a metric that flows from that. Um, is there opportunity for us to put something out that is enforceable, um, that health systems will uh, be expected to adopt when it comes to uh, moving patients out of the ED. Um, other thoughts on specific action items or things. And again, you know, I'm, I appreciate Dan, you sent an email to Chris and a few others about kind of bulletized potential action items that require involvement of the state, right? Or that we can recommend to the state that have action. Uh, I can make a whole bunch of recommendations to my administration about things that I think we should try to do better, but that doesn't require anybody outside of my administration and our health health system to actually do it. And so convincing somebody that inpatient hallway medicine distributed evenly is better than 20 borders in the ED, that may or may not be applicable or even possibly enforceable at other health systems. It certainly isn't something that I, I can imagine the state is going to say, we expect inpatient hallway medicine to look like this. And if you don't do it, you're going to have this penalty. Um, are there other thoughts that live kind of more broadly that we think we can bring back to the, you know, our partners at the state? Things that we didn't talk about here or, or ideas that you wanted to add to that we did talk about. No. Nope. All right. Anybody have last thoughts? Yeah, I would just say that as we're going through this exercise, I, I just want to encourage folks to think about other stakeholders to involve. I think in a DPH, there's areas where we can potentially play an enforcement role. CHA can certainly help, but I want to encourage the group to kind of think past DPH and CHA um, about what other interventions can be employed here. Um, because I think just on the DPH side, given where the state is with the budget, um, and it's likely going to be challenging next year as well, um, there won't be a lot of resources that the state will have at its disposal to solve this problem. So I, I want to encourage the group to get creative and think about other things outside of um, you know state budget that we can be doing to to help resolve this issue. So. That's just what I'll I'll say to, to end it, but uh, I'm excited to, to work with you all on this. Appreciate it. I also think, you know, and, and I'll reference it, maybe one last comment. Dan, you made some uh, reference early on about the, not the necessarily public shaming, but just kind of the sharing and awareness of perhaps one health system that introduces a model or an idea or try something and it works. And uh, and then that information somehow gets networked across. So if Hartford Healthcare puts out some attempt at using, uh, you know, a discharge lounge, and it rolls out at all of the sister Hartford Healthcare hospitals, and there's data even in real time as it's going forward that hey, this is really helping us. We've gone from here to here on our borders or on our time of discharge or whatever, I do think there's value in sharing that with our partners across the system. That doesn't necessarily require state or regulatory involvement, and it may or may not move the needle, but it doesn't hurt, right? I, I think there is value in that, um, you know, especially if it's a low cost entity, right? If it's something you can do without adding FTEs, without spending a bunch of money, just by movement of things within your within your system, 
that make that discharge process faster, smoother, better, more efficient, whatever it is. Uh, I certainly see this group somewhat indirectly as an opportunity for that sort of group think. Uh, and where something might work in my system, you guys say that'll never work here or, or vice versa. So uh, Miriam, kind of to your point, not everything lives with us bringing it to you for action. I think some of the success with these group of you know ed leaders this group of ed leaders is hey what can we all kind of brainstorm on and say wow i hadn't thought of that that's a pretty good idea let me bring that back to my local leadership and maybe we can move the needle so um other thoughts doc uh john dan greg anything well one thought that i kind of had i actually have a a part of the connecticut nurses association as well and i just got an email about uh the working group that is trying to expand workforce uh, strategy in Connecticut, um, adding on more public education for nurses and aides and all of that. I think that that's pretty exciting and something to watch to expand the workforce in Connecticut that could help the ED boarding, you know, with more, more staff. Um, but then also at the same time, we also have the, um, staffing committees uh, legislation that just rolled out last year that might limit and kind of constrict the the ED boarding. So I think kind of thinking outside of the, um, you know, just thinking about like the staffing issues that we have and how, how we're, uh, that can impact uh, ED boarding, even as it is currently standing today. Yeah, and I think there's, there's been a lot of uh, emphasis at the national level recently, ASEP and other uh, you know bodies that have started maybe to make a little bit of traction. Um, a, was it AHRQ or some somebody that recently ASEP uh, was able to convince under CMS to kind of form the equivalent of this kind of working group uh, in DC at the you know at the national level where they're actually going to put some time into looking at solutions. I think the more we're aware of of what they're looking at and we can kind of uh, grab onto uh, potentially and then try to apply locally, you know, at our state level may have some success. Um, I will do my best to, to put out another, uh, you know, calendar invite between now and the third week of February. That's when our overall group gets back together or 21 or 22 February, I think something like that. So ideally somewhere in the week before that, uh, my ask of all of you is if you have anyone that's not, and Chris confirmed that this is a, an option, anyone who's not on this subgroup or even within our overall work group that might have stake, to Miriam's comment, kind of other stakeholders, whether that's from the EMS side, whether that's, um, you know, somebody in utilization review or case management or something in your system that maybe is willing to join us to speak to their ideas, um, I, you know, I think that's always welcome. Different perspective other than just a bunch of ED docs and, and nurses and ED people who uh, see things often always the same. Um, you know, uh, it, it might be a good idea for us to bring in a few folks uh, with perhaps a different uh, lens. Um, so thank you for your time and your contribution. I'm going to, you know, uh, merely once these minutes are kind of up and ready, I'll, I'll siphon through them and I'll pull up uh, ideas and I'll shrink this document or I'll add to the document that I started. It's an open document. Please feel free anytime you want to just throw ideas on there or add comments to the ones that I put on there. Uh, no pride in, in authorship for any uh, for anybody who adds to it from my end. Um, Doc, do you have anything else? Or are, you, are we good to go? I don't. Thanks for your leadership, John. Absolutely. Anybody else? Otherwise, I'm going to I'm going to adjourn us now, Amelia, 931. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Thanks guys. John. Have a good day.